The Voice of Russia World Service welcomes you to another edition of the Christian Message from Moscow. On March the 2nd, Lent began for Orthodox Christians in Russia. It will end on Easter, marked this year on the 19th of April. In connection with Lent, we present a sermon about the principal prayer of Lent by the elder Archimandrite Cyril, known to Orthodox people all over Russia. But before you hear it, listen to what the elder sees as the main aim of Lent. <laughs> как мать всех добродетелей. Почему? Потому что Бог по своей природе, по своему чувству, есть Бог любви и Бог мира. Archimand writes Cyril underlines that during Lent one must try to acquire love as the source of all virtues. Why? Because our Lord's nature is love. Our Lord is the God of love and peace. And St. Apostle Paul, in chapter 13 of his first epistle to the Corinthians, wrote, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And now let's listen to what Archimandrite Cyril says about the principal prayer of Lent. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Dear brothers and sisters, throughout land, after every church service, we hear the clergyman read a brief yet touching prayer. O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power, and idle talk. But give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience and love to thy servant. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions, and not to judge my brothers, for blessed art thou unto ages of ages. This prayer consists of just ten petitions, yet in penitent spirit and heartfelt distress that it evokes in people who listen to it, it surpasses all other prayers, which is why it is customarily read during Lent, when the Church summons us to achieve spiritual rebirth, the feat of self-denial, assiduous prayer and penitence, and the purging of one's sins. Every word of this prayer finds an echo of response in our souls, helping us recognize our failings and sins, teaching us to crave virtue. 
setting us in the frame of mind propitious for enlisting God's help in fighting one's passions. The author of this prayer, the venerable Yefrem Sirin, wept all his life, and so his prayer is permeated with profound penitence and sense of solace. The Venerable Yefrem begins his prayer with an address to God, My Lord. The Word of God reveals to us that our life is linked with God, depends on Him, and rests on Him. In His merciful hands is the fate of the righteous and unrighteous, good and evil, and all living beings and plants on this earth. No one and nothing can live a single day or hour without his life-giving Holy Spirit. So, sensing God's presence in our hearts, we cannot begin, further, or complete a single earthly deed without a prayer to Him and His blessing. God is indeed our Master, Lord and King of our life. In his first petition, the Venerable Yefrem Sirin asks the Lord to take away from him the spirit of sloth. Slothfulness is understandable to all. It is a laziness and negligence regarding the most vital daily affairs, and first and foremost, one's salvation. This slothfulness may drive a person to total idleness in spiritual life, as well as in daily chores. Outward slothfulness is familiar to us all, for we are all occasionally prone to this spiritual disease when we do not apply ourselves enough to prayer, forget to attend church service, or permit ourselves a hastiness during prayer in a bid to speedily be done with it, so as to indulge in leisure or vain chatter. However, when this illness puts down roots, affecting our entire spiritual forces, there follows a calamitous state of the spirit, when one no longer leads a true, normal life, because one lacks in one's soul the constant life-giving source that nourishes man's proper activity, and leads but an illusory, useless and fictitious life succumbing to fruitless daydreaming, futile and vain conversations, unable to apply himself to any worthwhile tasks. This sloth, idleness and negligence distract us from our principal object, salvation. So this is why we pray for the Lord to rid us of this disease. A reminder, you're listening to a sermon of Archimandrite Cyril Pavlov. In the second petition, the Venerable Yefrem asks the Lord to take from him the spirit of despondency. Despondency is a gloomy, somber state of the spirit when man sees only the dark side of everything in life. Nothing brings him joy nor satisfaction. The circumstances are all against him. Every minor thing causes irritation, and life itself is nothing short of a burden. According to the Holy Fathers, despondency comes from the above-mentioned slothfulness and idle thoughts, a lack of faith and repentance. Also leading to despondency are preceding sentiments of anger, hurt inflicted upon somebody, lack of fear of God, verbosity, lack of success at work or in one's private life, or various other failures. At the same time, very often despondency itself leads to another, much more dangerous inner state, that of despair, when man's thoughts frequently turn to suicide, 
and one starts to regard death as a welcome blessing of one's earthly existence. To succumb to despair means to break all ties with the surrounding world, losing touch with the prime source of our life, God. I've no wish to continue living. I've lost all interest in life and see no purpose in it. One might hear from one driven to despair. Since this disease is indeed a most grave one, the venerable Ephraim Syrian begs the Lord to rid him of it. This sin is such that one needs to pray most fervently and tirelessly to purge oneself of it. The Lord Saver himself teaches us this in the Bible, saying that one ought to always pray and not to faint. Archimandrite Cyril refers to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 18, verse 1. And he continues. A persistent, constant prayer, combined with faith in the power of prayer and the Lord's help, shall restore the link with the surrounding world and guard one from despondency. Likewise with prayer, one should work on one's conscience in the sacrament of repentance, opening one's heart to the benevolence of God, taking courage in its healing power. The reading of religious literature and a life built on the Lord's commandments are the best possible protection against the harmful spirit of despondency. In the third petition, the Venerable Ephraim asks the Lord to guide him away from the spirit of lust of power. This lust is characteristic of the sinful, proud nature of man and is manifested in all aspects of man's activity. For example, in the attitude of the father to the rest of the family members, a superior towards his subordinates, a mentor to his pupils, those elder towards those younger. Each strives to dominate over others, forcing his will on them. Such an attitude is at odds with the teachings of the Bible and the teachings of Christ, who himself exemplified profound humility and frequently said, But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Mention here is made of the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 20, verses 26 and 27, the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 10, verses 43 and 44, as well as the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 22, verses 22 and 26. Archimandrite Cyril continues. Closely linked with the sin of a lust of power is that of vain pride. So when we have a craving to teach, instruct or denunciate others, this is a sure sign of our spirit yielding to the lust of power. This unbridled power hunger renders one totally abhorrent to all around him, besides depriving the person in question of an ability to fight one's passions and sins. So this is why we pray to the Lord to take from us the lust for power, preventing it from laying claim to our soul. In the fourth petition, the venerable Ephraim Sirin asks the Lord to rid him of the spirit of idle talk that almost none of us are immune to. Every person loves to idle talk, while the gift of speech was given to us so that we might praise the Lord, and through the spoken word communicate with each other for mutual edification. There is a wise folk saying that refers to the spoken word as silver, and silence as gold. 
Many saints adhere to this wisdom, remaining silent when perhaps they might have spoken to good effect for the purpose of edification. Through idle talk, man lays waste to one's soul, rendering it weak, distracted, and dissipated. Let us observe how brief our Lord was in his teachings and instructions. The Lord's prayer is contained in just seven petitions, while the Beatitudes in nine verses. The angels, likewise, are but brief in their praise of the Lord. Like a jar which, if opened too often, lets out the elusive scent and rich flavor of whatever is inside it, thus the spirit of a person prone to idle talk cannot hold on to good thoughts and sentiments for long. Spursing forth but vilifications, words of condemnation, flattery, slander, etc. This is why during Lent the Holy Church prays in the words of the psalm, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips, incline not my heart to any evil thing. The Archimandrite quoted from Psalm 141, verses 3 and 4. Just as weeds overrun the soil, getting in the way of useful cereals, so empty, malignant words poison the soul, not allowing good thoughts and sentiments to flourish there. And so, dear brothers and sisters, if we constantly remember this, we shall certainly draw on the benevolence of God and shall be favoured by Him. We shall be granted the great joy of seeing the heavenly Jerusalem, the bliss of existing alongside all the heavenly forces and spirits of the righteous. And so always, particularly in the days of Lent, let us say, O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power and idle talk, but give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience and love to thy servant. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions and not to judge my brother, for blessed art thou unto ages of ages. Amen. You were listening to the Lent Sermon of Archimandrite Cyril, one of the best-known clergymen in the Orthodox world. And there we end another edition of the Christian Message from Moscow, prepared by producer Vladimir Dürmen, author, editor of the musical framework Tatiana Shvitsova, sound engineer Svetlana Fanasieva, and your host Svetlana Yakimenko and Pavel Novichkov. Until we meet again in a week's time, God save you all. We leave you with traditional Lent chants. Прими молитву нашу, сияю лесную отца, и помилуй нас. Я вот и есть един свят, и есть и един Господь, и Иисус Христос во славу Бога Отца ми. На всякий день благословлю тебя, Oh,
Voice of Russia World Service welcomes you to another program in the series Christian Message from Moscow, dedicated to Lent. We continue acquainting you with a sermon by Archimandrite Cyril, known to Orthodox people all over the world. The topic of the sermon is the principal prayer of Lent. Orthodox Lent began on March the 2nd and will end on Easter, marked this year on the 19th of April. Let me remind you what the Elder sees as the main aim of Lent. <laughs> Archimand writes Cyril underlines that during Lent one must try to acquire love as the source of all virtues. Why? Because our Lord's nature is love. Our Lord is the God of love and peace. And St. Apostle Paul, in chapter 13 of his first epistle to the Corinthians, wrote, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And now let's listen to what Archimandrite Cyril says about the principal prayer of Lent. O Lord and Master of my life, Take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power and idle talk. But give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience and love to thy servant. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions, and not to judge my brother, for blessed art thou unto ages of ages. Amen. So we continue to acquaint you with the spiritual essence of this remarkable prayer. This is what Archimandrite Cyril says. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In the previous discourse, dear brothers and sisters, we looked closely at the remarkable prayer of the Venerable Ephraim Searing, saying that it was imbued with a profound sense of penitence and humility, where every word struck a responsive chord in our soul, helping us to see clearly our passions and sins for what they truly are, kindling within us a yearning to achieve true virtue and goodness, without which nobody can achieve a proximity to God. Last time we dealt with the first four petitions, where the Venerable Ephraim Sirin begs the Lord to take away from him the spirit of sloth, 
despair, lust of power, and idle talk. Today, let us continue our discourse. In the fifth petition, the venerable Ephraim Sirin asks the Lord to grant him the spirit of chastity. Under chastity, in its general meaning, we are to suppose the overall gracious and pure state of man, embracing the notions of honesty, truthfulness, purity of heart and mind, good and honorable direction of one's will, and so on. A chaste person leads a chaste life. He is devoid of slyness, deceit, waverings, vulgar amusements and pleasures, and secret lusts. The foundation of this life is rooted in a firm and unshakable life within God's folds. In a more narrow and frequently quoted sense, this word presupposes a pure, chaste state of the soul when one guards oneself against not only sins of the flesh, but all sensual desires and thoughts. Nothing renders us so pleasing to God than chastity, and nothing so embellishes man at any age as a chaste and pristine state of one's soul. Just like a fresh, pure flower is intoxicatingly fragrant and pleases everyone around, so a chaste person is fresh, pure, and whole. Next in his sermon, Archimandrite Cyril refers to the second epistle of Peter the Apostle, chapter 1, verse 4, the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Romans, chapter 13, verse 14, the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Colossians, chapter 3, verse 5, and the first epistle general of Peter the Apostle, Chapter 2, verse 2. The Archimandrite says, The Lord's word reveals to us that defilement and lustful corruption are rampant in the world. People's concerns of the flesh turn into lust. So the Lord's word calls on us to renounce weaknesses of the flesh and root out the evil lust corroding our souls. The word of God also teaches us that Lecherous is not only he who indeed succumbs to lust, but also he who looks at a man or a woman with lustful thoughts. So let us guard the pure chastity of our hearts and souls. Let us not forget that chastity is a treasure, a holy object, as St. John Chrysostom refers to this. And so, how do we achieve this? People are by nature bashful, so let us develop this original foundation of our chastity, the purity of our souls and bodies. We need to avoid self-admiration of our bodies, for there lies the source of secret lusts and pleasures. Read nothing that is corrupt and tempting, and finally, Stamp out all lustful thoughts and desires within you. Moreover, learn to hate and despise them as incarnate manifestations of the lowest of elements of our nature. Cast your gaze more often on the ever pure and perfect image of the Holy Virgin, and most importantly, hasten to address our Lord with prayer, O Lord and Master of my life, Give me, thy servant, the spirit of chastity. In the sixth petition, the venerable Ephraim Sirin begs the Lord to give him the spirit of humility. Humility is viewed as a profound recognition by man of his spiritual poverty, 
when he deems himself worse than all others, lower than others, while looking up to them as both higher and better than oneself, and as such never judges or slanders anyone, speaks quietly, calmly, in few words, never pushing oneself forward as an example in anything, never arguing, readily relinquishing one's will, meekly accepting a subordinate role, never lapsing into idle talk, never cheating, joyfully enduring all insult and abasement, loving hard work, never disappointing anyone, and never wounding their conscience. Such are the typical characteristics of genuine humility. Without humility there can be no salvation, for only then do our virtues find value with our Lord when they are found on humility. The more a humble person receives, the more grateful to God he is, and all the more does he acknowledge his own poverty. Only through humility can the gifts of grace be augmented, and it is only the humble who do not fall, for since they hold themselves to be lower than the rest, they have nowhere to fall. Archimandrite Cyril recalls words from the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, verse 3 and chapter 11 of the same Gospel, verse 29. Blessed are the poor in spirit, says our Lord the Saviour. Upon beginning our salvation, he accepted the image of servant, humbling himself, and now calls on us to follow his example and learn from him humility and meekness. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. The essence of humility lies in self-effacement for Christ in renunciation of one's pride and self-aggrandizement apostle peter teaches us all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility for god resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble that was a quote from the first epistle of peter the apostle chapter 5 verse 5 my dear ones we, at times, find it very hard to be subordinate to one another and to look upon others as being higher and better than ourselves. For we all, secretly or openly, place ourselves above the rest. Thus it is extremely hard for us to acknowledge we are more sinful, weak, lowly, culpable than all the others. So our pride holds us captive, disguising our true value and forcing us to overestimate ourselves. Meanwhile, nothing brings down such God's grace in us as humility. Humility elevates a person, while pride, quite the opposite, debases one, rendering the person repulsive to all around him. The Venerable Ephraim Sirin writes that the moment a man grows humble, God's grace descends upon him, and his heart senses the heavenly support and guidance, for, but to this man will I look, says the Lord to the prophet, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Those were words from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 2. Humility is a great gift, one we must ask the Lord for. O Lord and Master of my life, give me the spirit of humility.
In the seventh petition, the Venerable Ephraim Syrian asks the Lord to give him the spirit of patience. We all require patience if we want to achieve salvation. For only he that endureth to the end, says the Lord, shall be saved. The argument, writes Cyril, refers to lines from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 10, verse 22. Only one who, patiently, with unshakable faith in God and His mercy, endures all hardships of earthly life, shall be saved. Ye have need of patience, says Apostle Paul, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. One must beg for patience, just as any other virtue and any other gift, from our Lord, in continuous prayer, with enduring hope for his profound clemency. Lord, grant me patience not for serving people or passions, but for serving you, my Master, who suffered immeasurable grief and agony for my sake. When life's dire hardships and sorrows rise up against me, when I should encounter human envy, vilifications, and slander, or if my heart bleeds with anguish at losses suffered, grant me strength to support me so frail and feeble, and guard me from railing in resentment against people or you, my master. When illness riddles my body, or spiritual malaise assails me, when my spirit weakens in its service to you, and the darkness of despondency shrouds my soul, all the more I beg you to send me in my affliction your invigorating strength, and give me patience, so that I might be spared from sinking to despair. In the eighth petition, the venerable Ephraim Sirin asks the Lord to grant him the spirit of love. Nothing is more innate to our nature than love, since our Maker created us disposed to be favorably inclined towards others and to love one another. God himself is essentially perfect love. Nothing renders us so like God or draws us so close to our Maker as the virtue of love. Love is the root and the summit point, the beginning and the consummation of all virtues, the ultimate perfection. To substantiate his thoughts, Archimand writes Cyril refers to the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Colossians, chapter 3, verse 14 as well as the words of the Apostle Peter from his first epistle, chapter 4, verse 8. Love is the source of life, and it is life, for without it humanity would have long since declined. Our heart cannot live and develop without love. Deprived of it, it shrinks in anguish, it languishes in a spiritual wasteland, while on the other hand, nourished by love, it expands, it thrives, and attracts the grace of God, cleansing itself of all sins. Archimandrite Cyril quotes the concept of love from the first epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 4 to 7. Christian love suffereth long and is kind, envieth not, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh not evil, 
rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. We are witness to a shining example of such love in our Lord Jesus Christ, who, when crucified, prayed for those who tortured him. He is long-suffering in bearing with our multiple sins. He is charitable towards us. He despises pride and enormity, exasperation and all evils. He alone is the truth. He loves each and every one of us always. And so we are all called upon to follow the example of our Lord and Master. Brothers and sisters, love the Lord for his mercy towards us. Love his Holy Mother for her intercession on our behalf, unworthy that we are. Love all the saints, for they pray for our sinner's soul. Love your fathers and mothers who brought you into this world. Love all your neighbors, even your enemies, and pray to God for their souls, never forgetting that a love for God and your fellow men is the cornerstone of the law and the prophets. Love everyone, and you shall be with God, and God there will be inside you. So may we never tire of praying to God so that he might grant us the spirit of love. My beloved brethren, time flies swiftly and the months and the years pass by while we approach that divide, that ultimate crossroads where our fate shall be forever sealed a good life shall justify us, an evil one call us to answer. So let us humbly beg of God, O Lord and Master of my life, give the spirit of chastity, humility, patience and love to thy servant. Amen. You were listening to a discourse by Archimandrite Cyril devoted to the sermon by the Venerable Ephraim Syrian, The Principal Prayer of Lent, which Orthodox Christians of Russia are presently observing. And there we end another edition of the feature Christian Message from Moscow prepared by producer Vladimir Diomen, editor and author of the musical framework Tatiana Shvitsova, sound engineer Svetlana Vanasiva, and your host, Svetlana Yekimenko, and Pavel Novichkov. All the best to you. God preserve you from all evil and harm.
The Voice of Russia World Service welcomes you to another program in the series Christian Message from Moscow, dedicated to Lent. Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power and idle talk, but give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience and love to thy servant. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions, and not to judge my brother, for blessed art thou unto ages of ages. Amen. That was the prayer of the Venerable Ephraim Syrian, the principal prayer of Lent. Today we finish acquainting you with a discourse by Archimandrite Cyril, Pavlov, elucidating the essence of this prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Beloved brothers and sisters, at the beginning of Lent, the Church instructs us that while fasting physically, we fast spiritually too. The Church shows us that a genuine and agreeable to God's fasting presupposes renunciation of all evil thoughts and deeds, temperance of the tongue, the curbing of violent passions, rooting out of lust, minimization of falsehood and perjury. Thus, if we, while refraining from partaking of food and drink, at the same time do not refrain from succumbing to feelings of anger, resentment, envy, hate, evil wishing, condemnation, then, although we do not partake of bread, we are absorbing our fellow man, and while creating with one hand, are destroying with the other. Thus, from the very beginning, the Holy Church offers us the profoundly pithy prayer of the Venerable Ephraim Siren, whose spirit of penitence awakens in us a longing to seek virtues and disgust for one's sins. In the sixth petition of this prayer, the Venerable Ephraim asks God to give him the spirit of humility. O Lord and King, give me, thy servant, the spirit of humility. So, what is humility? Humility is a state of the soul when, upon accepting its own weakness and impurity, it is far removed from any high estimate of itself, constantly seeks to divulge only what is good within itself, while eradicating everything evil, yet never deems itself having achieved perfection, and expects it only from the Lord's grace, and not from its own exertions. The Holy Fathers and Church Elders cannot find words for praising this virtue, 
The Lord lives in humble souls, they say. Neither asceticism, nor vigil, nor any other labor shall save us, unless there is due humility. You're listening to another edition of the feature Christian Message from Moscow, where Archimandrite Cyril Pavlov elucidates the essence of the principal prayer of Lent, the prayer of the Venerable Ephraim Syrian. Despite the great value and significance of humility, we possess but a very little share of it. We are at the mercy of the spirit of obverse or secret pride, so that almost every one of us thinks much and highly of oneself, and little and low of others. Even those whose situation demands that they accept humility refuse to be humble before their elders. Yet each and every one elevates themselves, self-aggrandizes, disinclined to humble and chasten themselves. I am no worse than others, people traditionally say, placing themselves high above others. Almost no one stops to dwell on the need to humbly serve all and everyone. If we elevate, aggrandize and extol ourselves while despising our fellow men, how shall we be able to humbly serve them? This is why, in both family and society at large, instead of love, accord, and mutually rewarding services, we find a mutually unyielding attitude, lack of compromise, envy, jealousy, arguments, discord and strife, while the virtue of humility is almost fallen into oblivion. Yet, at the same time, humility is almost one most favored by God. The Lord himself says, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Those were words from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 2. Archimandrite Cyril continues. Humility, says the venerable Simeon, the new theologian, embraces the notions of obedience, patience, acknowledgement of man's feebleness, gratitude to God for everything, for honor and dishonor, health and illness, wealth and poverty. The venerable Ephraim Syrian points to even more characteristics of true humility. Never condemn or judge anyone, nor humiliate or slander anyone. Speak quietly, measuredly and unfrequently never putting oneself forward as an example in anything. Never argue with anyone about faith or anything else. Yet, if someone says something good, to answer yes to them. But if someone says something bad, to tell them, you yourself know. To be in subordination to others and suppress one's own will. Never be prone to idle talk, never lie, or questions those higher. Gladly endure insult, humiliation. Love hard work, never disappointing others, nor wounding others' conscience. The essence of humility lies in self-effacement in the name of God, self-renunciation, the renunciation of one's pride and self-aggrandizement. If we desire to be true Christians, we must exhort ourselves to the utmost in awakening within ourselves the spirit of humility and aspiration to serve others, so that we might love humility and not believe it could debase us, but on the contrary, understand that it serves to elevate us to welcome spiritual heights. We should always remember that Pride is repugnant to our Lord and all our fellow men. While our humility draws favor 
and grace of people and God, and it is promised a reward from our Maker. He who thinks highly of oneself, places oneself above others, is proud and looks only to oneself, while displaying negligence towards others, is contemptible, sordid, and vile before God. That which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Those work quotations from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 16, verse 15, and chapter 14, verse 11. We continue the program. Blessed is he, says the venerable Isaac Siren, who humbles himself in everything, for he shall be exalted. Thus, belittle yourself in all and in front of everyone. Forestall everyone with a greeting and bow, and you shall be honored. Humble yourself before God, and you shall notice not how your glory will augment. All of your life acknowledge yourself as sinner, and so that in all of your life you might be justified. Be an ignoramus in your wisdom, but do not seek to seem wise while being an ignoramus. Be, as the Saviour teaches, a servant and slave for the benefit of all around, and you shall achieve perfection and supremacy. Without humility, all our virtues and feats cannot have actual value before God. Without humility, writes Venerable Hierarch Tikhon of Zadonsk, a prayer loses in value. Without humility, there may not be genuine penitence, but only a pretense and falsehood, coming from the lips rather than from the heart. Without humility, asserts the venerable Isaac Siren, all our deeds are but in vain, as are all virtues. Truly, this is so. It is said of the venerable Arseni the Great that once the Lord's angel brought him the following vision. The door to the church was wide open. Two men were carrying a wooden beam to the church and needed to enter it. However, since they were carrying the beam not lengthwise, as they ought to, but breadthwise, they couldn't enter. Moreover, neither of the two wanted to make way for the other, but wanted to enter simultaneously. The feat was impossible, even though the church doors were wide open. The Venerable Arseni asked the angel, What does this vision signify? And the angel explained, These people, carrying the beam, perceive themselves to be devout and virtuous men. Yet they are burdened by pride, refuse to yield, one to the other. And so they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, but remain outside, due to their pride. So let us try to master this virtue, dear brothers and sisters, never forgetting that humility exalts one, while pride debases, depriving one of God's grace. Let us pray assiduously to the Lord, O Lord and King, give me, thy servant, the spirit of humility. 
for blessed art thou unto ages of ages. Amen. You were listening to the sermon of Archimandrite Cyril Pavlov, dedicated to the prayer of the Venerable Ephraim Syrian, the principal prayer of Lent. And there we end another edition of the series Christian Message from Moscow. It was prepared for you by producer Vladimir Dumin, editor and author of the musical framework Tatiana Shvitsova, sound engineer Svetlana Afanasyeva, and your hosts Svetlana Yekimenko and Pavel Novichkov. And in conclusion, listen to Chants of Lent performed by monastery and secular choruses. God save you all. Until we meet again next week. <laughs>